Good. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to this part three um, of our series on the kingdom. So we're going to come before the Lord and open in prayer. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We thank and praise you for your goodness, for your grace, and for your mercy. We thank you all tonight that we can study your word together. And we pray that we'll be greatly encouraged tonight as we consider your word. Please speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, to learn and to grow as we consider your word this evening. Thank you for everyone that joins us and for those who also listen to the recording. And we just thank and praise you that we can be together tonight. In your wonderful name, we pray the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So. This evening we continue, and of course the, the last discussion we had was on the Abrahamic covenant. So tonight we are considering the Mosaic covenant in, in relation to the kingdom. Now tonight is a bit uh, tricky because we're covering a, a large section um, of the Bible. Not that we're going to do that, but when you're dealing with the Mosaic covenant and the law, it covers a large portion of the scriptures. So it is quite a, a big portion, but we're going to try and, and condense that and, and, and highlight some very, very important thoughts for us tonight as we consider this Mosaic covenant. Now, as we've discussed throughout the, the first uh, few parts of this, this series, um, the scriptures declare that there will be a future messianic kingdom on earth. And I believe it's a physical kingdom, a messianic kingdom, and will be on this physical planet. And what we see throughout the scriptures is the real focus for God to restore what the Bible calls God's rule or basically theocratic rule on the earth. So theocratic basically means that God is in control physically on earth. Now that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned. We haven't really had theocratic rule on the whole earth, but that is what the kingdom will ultimately restore when Jesus Christ returns. So we know that that was lost um, in Eden. And, and basically that is what we see throughout the world. We see destruction and difficulties and all the struggles we see, which is just a sign to us that there is a disconnect between earth and God, not in his sovereignty, he's still sovereign, still in control, but he doesn't exercise that control and physical presence on earth in a rule, uh, from a rule perspective. It, it, it basically allows life to continue. And because we are born in sin and because sin prevails, we have all of these struggles. So what we read throughout the Old Testament, and this is where we're sort of seeing this development of, of the kingdom dynamic is that God ultimately starts bringing into play his plan to restore the kingdom, to restore that theocratic rule, and to bring about his, his ultimate plan and purpose. And as we considered in the last uh, talk that we did, we had the Abrahamic covenant, which is a very famous one. We Most people know that Sunday school songs are sung about it, of Father Abraham where God enters into an everlasting covenant with Abraham, which is important. And this Abrahamic covenant is about a future that God has promised, that through Abraham and through his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, of course, that is twofold. It is through Israel that the world will be blessed, but also, of course, ultimately through the Lord Jesus Christ as the singular seed, the one that will bring about salvation. So through this Abrahamic covenant, what we see is a messianic reign where Jesus Christ will be the one who brings about the blessing to the nations. You even see that in, in, Christmas, in the Christmas um, events and account with Simeon and that famous prayer that he prays that he will be a light to the Gentiles and also bring salvation to Israel. So ultimately, that's part of the picture of the Abrahamic covenant. So a messianic reign, a physical kingdom, and that blessing will come through Israel and also ultimately through the Lord Jesus 
Christ. So that's the sort of picture of the, the Abrahamic covenant, which is far more global. It's far more focused on how the nations will be reached. And it's an overarching covenant, which, of course, we read about in the book of Galatians, chapter three as well. A sort of overarching dynamic. Now we see even in the book of Romans, we see how Abraham is discussed as, as the father of faith. Now tonight, as we really sort of sink our teeth into the kingdom, we, we're becoming a bit more specific. So the Abrahamic covenant is, is, is even more general than what we're dealing with tonight. Because we're dealing with the messianic covenant, or the most mosaic covenant, sorry, the mosaic covenant is very, very important which covers a large portion of scripture, all the way from Exodus right through into the Gospels, which will be very important for us tonight. So this covenant, this Mosaic covenant, was exclusively given to Israel. So where the Abrahamic covenant was made with Abraham, and of course then his descendants, which also is Israel, what we see with the Mosaic Covenant is that it's specifically made with a group of people, with a nation. It's not made with one person. It's made with the nation of Israel. And this is important because this is the Old Testament. And sometimes um, when we read the Old Testament and Christians read the Old Testament, they don't always understand the purpose of the Old Testament. The purpose of the Old Testament is to show how God used Israel as a conduit of blessing and ultimately that will birth the Messiah. And sometimes people read that as if it's normal Christian life and they're trying to find all the type of Christian analogies and dynamics in there, but it's not the purpose of the Old Testament. The purpose of the Old Testament is to show us how God preserved Israel to bring about the birth of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ who will then save the world. But I want you to turn with me to Psalm 147, so Psalm 147, we just want to read uh, from verse 19 to 20. So Psalm 147, verse 19 to 20. And it's important, and I will repeat and emphasize these things, because it can't just be mentioned once. It, it needs to be in our thinking what Israel is, God's purpose for Israel, and how that all fits together in the scriptures. This is very, very important. So 147, Psalm 147, verse 19 to 20. He, de he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his judgment, they have not known them praise the Lord. So the key there is that God deals with Israel and he hasn't dealt with other nations like he has dealt with Israel. And that is very, very important. But the question for us tonight is, as we consider the kingdom and we look at the Old Testament, how is God going to reveal his plan to the world? Because part of the Bible, part of who God is, is to reveal himself. How was he going to do that? How, do you how would God reveal himself to all the nations at one time? That wouldn't work like that. So God chose to, to reveal himself firstly to Israel as a nation by entering into this covenant with them. And that will then flow over into the rest of the world. And that's very, very important. But as we look at Abraham, we see through Abraham, we have the birth of the nation. We have the sort of circumcision and that sort of part of the covenant. And many people will look at Abraham as the, the father of the Jewish people, 100% he is. But many people will look at Abraham thinking that that was the birth of the nation of Israel. Now, that's not incorrect. It is correct. But actually, when you read the scriptures and you look at how the Bible speaks of the birth of Israel, the, the Bible doesn't always focus on Abraham as the birth of Israel. The Bible focuses on the time when they left Egypt as actually the birth of the nation. Because it's more than just genetics we're talking about here. It is about this called out group, this group of, of Jewish people who then left Egypt. And that was actually how the Bible looks at the birth 
of Israel, the birth of the nation. It's quite interesting as I was reading through this and just preparing some thoughts, it didn't really cross my mind until I read it that, as we know, it's pretty obvious, but Israel was in, they were slaves in Egypt for more than 400 years. Can we try and wrap our heads and fathom 400 years? And then we get to the book of Acts. People find it difficult to see the 30-year period of the book of Acts as the sort of establishment of the church. That's difficult. But Israel was in Egypt for 400 years. So they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And then, of course, God delivers them through Moses. And it's all connected to the covenant which is very important, but I just want to lay the foundation to, to why we sort of look at Israel leaving Egypt as the birth of the nation, as the beginning of something, which is where this Mosaic covenant fits in. Firstly, I've just got a few things I, I want to mention to you on that. It's very interesting that the word for church is the Greek word ecclesia, which basically means a called out group a group that God calls out to fulfill a very specific purpose. When when you look at the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 38, you can just write it down. I'm not going to go to that. But in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 38, Stephen, when he's preaching to uh, the Jewish leaders, speaks about the congregation in the wilderness. Now, that word congregation, when you look at the Greek, is the word ecclesia. So Stephen is saying that there was an ecclesia or a called out group, a congregation or a church in the wilderness. What was that church? What was that called out group? It was the nation of Israel that left Egypt. And this is very significant. Because God saved them out of Egypt, and so they became a group, a called-out group, and a nation, because ethnically, they were pretty much the same. Of course, biblically, there were some Egyptians that, that went with as well, but it was an ethnic group of Jewish people. So that's quite interesting that the, the first church, actually, was the church in the wilderness. Hello. Yes. Yeah, so... Presumably, this is where um, our reform brothers, they say the church is Israel and Israel is a church. We see a dis- clear distinction. They're two separate entities. But presumably, their justification for them saying the church is Israel is that those verses like Stephen quoted and that. Is, is that correct? I don't think they would use that, Kenny, but their justification would be the covenant, which we'll deal with. So they'll link it into the covenant. Right. That God enters into a covenant. Because it would actually undermine a little bit of that thinking if there was a church in the wilderness, because it, because Stephen's drawing a distinction between that church. Right. Okay. So I, I actually use that in my favor in the argument, <laughs> which is great. So so, yes, yeah, so firstly, as we look at this, this Mosaic covenant, there's a called out group that God enters into a covenant with. That called out group is the same ethnically as with Abraham, but now we have a very specific group of people, not just one man. Secondly, when you look at all the feasts of Israel, what, what is the reminder of these feasts? It's always a reminder of Egypt and the wilderness. Because you have the Feast of, 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 of Tabernacles, which relates to the wilderness. You've got the Passover relating to Egypt, of course. And all the feasts were sort of being instituted in that time period, which establishes the worship and the dynamics of what is remembered, of how God delivers them. And that is the key focus of this important covenant that's not just overarching, but very specific with a specific group of people. Also, um, 
what we see in the wilderness. And as they leave Egypt to go toward the promised land, we also see part of the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled of going to this promised land because Abraham never stayed in the promised land. He sort of was there a little bit, but didn't stay there. Now the, the nation is actually going to enter into this, this promised land, which is still connected still to the Abrahamic covenant, which is important. But I want you to turn with me tonight, which is a very important passage, is Jeremiah 31, which is a very, very important passage. Try and remember Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34. And why, these, why is this sort of preamble and this foundational thoughts important? Because when we think of the kingdom, it is physical with Christ seated, of course, in, in Jerusalem on the throne. But it is connected to the covenants. And that is why we have to, as Christians, I believe, stay away from this kingdom thought that is this sort of spiritual reality that that has no physicality or trace to it the kingdom is connected to things that have come before and that's important so when we look at jeremiah 31 31 to 34 firstly later on i just want to read some more from that but we're only going to focus on on 31 to 34 and it says behold the days are coming says the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, no, the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The key there is that this new covenant will not be the same as the old covenant that was made, not with Abraham. The Mosaic covenant wasn't made with Abraham. It was made with Israel and with, and specifically Moses being the dispenser of that in uh, the, the wilderness. And when he led them out of Egypt, and that's very, very important. And Jeremiah connects the new covenant with something that is new, that has now come. It's built on principles of the old, but the old passes away. But there is a very strong connection still within that. And then also, what you find within this dynamic of this new sort of church dynamic and of course it's going to sort of really rack people's brains when you talk about the church in 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 the wilderness but i want you to turn with me to first corinthians 10 verse 2 so first corinthians chapter 10 verse 2 first corinthians chapter 10 verse 2 We're going to read from verse 1. So verse 1 and 2. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. Or all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So what you have is this whole dynamic of a new body, a new nation that is formed that is basically called out of egypt that is given this covenant which we'll deal with in more detail and also that they are baptized of course not with with water because it was a dry baptism because they walked through the red sea on dry land but they're baptized into moses there's an identification with moses and with this covenant and that is what you see throughout the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, the covenant is the important dynamic. And I'm going to lay that out for you. So that when we consider the kingdom and what the New Testament then later on 
give certain dynamics to the kingdom, what is spoken of in the book of Revelation, what the prophet spoke about, which we'll, of course, deal with in the next couple of sessions. The expectation is for the covenant people, where this covenant has been made with them, that will experience this kingdom. That this concept that the church is this sort of new Israel and it's a spiritual kingdom dynamic is something that's been inserted into scripture and in the mindset of some, but it's not the expectation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament expectation is with the group of people, which are the Jewish people, and that they enter into this covenant and that they are immersed into this and that that's the expectation of the kingdom. And we're going to highlight that a bit more. So I just want to settle that in our minds that we're dealing here with a specific group of people. Because now we sort of move on and I ask the question in our, in our understanding of, of what is the law? Because we're going to look in more detail. There are some verses we're going to highlight of, of this covenant. But, but as we look at the law, of course, which, which starts being revealed to us in Exodus 19 to 24, which is the sort of principles of the Mosaic law of this Mosaic covenant. As we read the Old Testament, what we see is that God makes this covenant with Israel, which we'll read in a bit, makes this covenant, but there are laws connected to this covenant. And the question that we have to ask is what was the purpose of the law and, and how does this relate? How does the, the law is given in the covenant help us or to understand a bit more about life in the Old Testament? Because we're not dealing here with some spiritual thing, it's physical. Because when you consider the law and the law that was given to Israel, and it's part of the covenant. What you're dealing with is this group of people now, what they need is they need moral guidance because they've come from Egypt. It is moral guidance. You're also dealing with the nation. So you need civil laws to govern the people. And also you need ceremonial or religious laws for them to worship. Because you can imagine what they were exposed to in Egypt and their understanding. So God sets the tone in establishing this covenant with Israel and giving them the law that what we are seeing is the moral laws, the civil society that is being created, and also the ceremonial laws that were given as part of the religious dynamics. And for what purpose does he give this? Why does he give this to Israel? Why is the law important as we read the Old Testament? What does it do? And there are, there are three specific things that, that I highlight in the law, and we're going we're gonna to build on that. Firstly, is to make Israel a peculiar people, is to make them different. And this is important as we consider the kingdom, because Israel is an important part of the kingdom. And God gave them the law and he made this covenant with them and gave them these laws to make sure that they will be a peculiar or different people. The law was also given and I'm not talking about the 10 commandments. Only we're talking about the 600 laws. All the laws were given to show God's holiness, to show us God's standard of his absolute holiness. And this is important as we, consider the kingdom. So all of these things are important. But ultimately for us as Christians today, looking back at the Old Testament, something that was there for Israel and also for us is important in the law. The law was given to show us we need a savior. That the law was given so that we can see God stand and how far we fall short. And we are in desperate need of redemption, of atonement of forgiveness and of salvation and that's all part of the process but when we think of the law people just think of it as a bad thing and that's why i want to sidestep that tonight in our thinking of the kingdom that the law is not bad the law is perfect the law was bad for sinners because it highlights our sin but this thinking within the church that we sort of disregard the law and it's just a bad thing we want to sidestep but that's not understanding it 
We know that the law doesn't save us. Our salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we look at the law, it fulfilled a very important purpose and will continue to do so, as I will show you throughout tonight. Also, the law, what it did was give us this picture of Christ, as, because all the things that happened in the law were shadows of Christ. It showed us who God is, how to worship him, and ultimately the picture of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is important because when you read about the kingdom, and as the series unfolds, we consider that. What you see in the kingdom is you have the Messiah, the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will be worshipped. How do we worship him? What is the process in the kingdom for people to worship? Is it just we're going to have a church service? We're going to have someone on the, on, the, on the piano there and on the guitar? If you just threw it out to the Gentiles, how do we worship? So the law is important. The feasts are important. The whole dynamic is important because it fits into the kingdom process. Where you have Jesus Christ on the throne, Israel as the preeminent nation that is the, these priests that help in the process of, of worship in the kingdom, which of course we'll highlight as we go on in, in this concept of Mosaic covenant. Also, the kingdom, when you when you read about the kingdom, when you think of the kingdom, what we must connect always with the kingdom is theocratic rule. That it is God's physical rule on earth. That is the kingdom. That is the expectation. Yes, Jesus Christ is sovereign and he is ruling. We understand that in a general sense. But the expectation is that the king must be coronated. The king is physically absent. And the expectation in the Bible is his coronation. How do I know that? Because Revelation 19 talks about that. That he comes as the rider on the white horse. So the expectation throughout scripture in Zechariah 12, that we're constantly going to refer to throughout this, this series, the expectation is that the king comes physically to establish his kingdom and to establish this theocratic rule. And the Messiah is the one that brings that to pass. But what was the Mosaic law? The Mosaic law was God's theocratic rule without physically being the king. So when you read the law, what it is, it's God's standards, God's expectation, God ruling Israel and as a people, as a sort of foretaste and picture of what the kingdom will be like. Because in the kingdom, you don't want adultery in the kingdom. You're not going to have murder and promiscuity and all these things. So the law was a picture to us as we read it and to Israel of what the expectation is, of what the foretaste is, of what the kingdom would be like. Kenneth? Yes. Um, is, obviously, you know, I'm very much in tune with all this, but. I, I thought it just occurred to me because obviously you're emphasizing um, the fact that the Israel, the Jews, are expecting a physical kingdom. They they ha only have a concept of a physical. Yep. kingdom. So the reality is that certainly in Britain and dare I say much of the world, even the church understands the kingdom only for today in a spiritual context so do you think would you say that actually for the jews today they have a difficulty there's a there's a hurdle that that needn't be there but much of the church presents that the kingdom is all spiritual because yeah they, would you would you go along with that definitely and that's why when you when you Jenny would speak about the scriptures. That's why the Old Testament is, is difficult within the Christian mind today. Because when you're actually speaking to Jewish, maybe a rabbi or someone that actually knows the scriptures, what we present is actually not what they read in the Old Testament. So spot on. 
hundred percent. So I'm just trying to still settle that you got this group of people, the nation of Israel, and they are given these laws for a very specific purpose to keep them separate and to and to fulfill a very important purpose. But now let's consider the covenant because I want to get into uh, Exodus 19 because we have the nation leaving Egypt that God speaks to them and ultimately will have the law given from the, from Exodus chapter 19 but that we have a very clear understanding of, of why God gave the law. It was his standard. It was to keep Israel separate and to show them that they need a savior. But as we look at, at Exodus uh, 19, I just want you to turn with me there. We, we should be able to find that one quite quickly, of course. It's Exodus 19. And we look at verse 5 and 6. <coughs> So Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. And it says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for, uh, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Very important two verses. So God calls them out. He's going to give them the law. So generally we looked at the purpose, but now it's a bit more specific. He's entered into a covenant with them. And this covenant is a bit different from the Abrahamic covenant. Because the Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. It wasn't about... Abraham being 100% faithful. God made a promise to him through your seed. Not, of course, is, is Isaac. The world will be blessed. That's a fact. Even when Sarah did not believe and she giggled and laughed about it, doesn't change the perspective. It's going to happen because this is God's purpose. But what you read here in verse 5 and 6 is God's called this generation and he enters into this covenant with them. But it is conditional. Not conditional to Israel. But conditional to this generation. And that's the difference. That's the key in scripture that I just would love people to see when we're dealing with this, this covenant, this Mosaic covenant. That God enters in and through Abraham, he, he calls these people. But every single generation of Jewish people of the nation is in this covenant with God, but it is conditional to that generation. If that generation falls away or doesn't serve him the way that they should, there is judgment. But then the next generation might be different. So God never leaves Israel. It just depends on which generation is ultimately the one that is faithful. And in the Old Testament, there are good generations and there are bad ones. As there are good kings and there are bad kings. But God enters into this covenant with them saying that you will be a special people to me. And you'll be able to be this, this, this kingdom of priests and a holy nation as you follow and serve me. And you can read about this whole covenant from, from Exodus 19 right through to 24. And of course, you've got all the laws, then everything, as I've just mentioned. But the key here is that the first time that we hear the term kingdom is here in verse 6 of Exodus 19. Where it says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, how can you be a kingdom? What do you need to have a kingdom? You need a king, mm -hmm. don't you? And that's the expectation and a very important expectation. And that's why I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy 17 and verse 14 to 20. So right here in Exodus, the expectation is that you're going to be a kingdom and we're going to deal with the whole priest's dynamic. But the kingdom is important because you can't have a kingdom unless you have a king. And in Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, we have this clear expectation that God gives of Israel going to birth the king. 
Now, most people in theological circles won't debate that. They won't disagree with that. But the issue is, is this physical or is it, can it just be a spiritual thing where Christ now is ruling from the heavenlies and that's the kingdom? And, and that's where I would, would, would have an issue with it because I don't think it's just spiritually there. There has to be the physical part to this, an element, which is the physical kingdom to come. But let's look at Deuteronomy 17. And some read from verse 14 to 20, because it's important. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren. You shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses, but he shall not multiply horses from his Now, this is important. I mean, I don't want to go into sort of modern day stuff, but just listen to what the king should do in comparison to what kings have done. Listen to what it says here. But you but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself. So there God speaks out against polygamy. Lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom and he and his children in the midst of Israel. Did Israel ever have a king like that? No king, even David, who is the man after God's own heart, Solomon, none of them were like this. The only one close that I can read where there's a bit of this dynamic is Josiah when he receives the word. What is this talking about? God is saying that this is actually the expectation. And guess what? Did Israel ever see this? No. Because what are they waiting for? Who are they waiting to for his coronation? Who's ultimately going to be this type of king? Will be the Lord Jesus Christ. They haven't seen it in earthly kings. But the expectation is a kingdom with a king. That is the expectation. Is that what we've seen in the Old Testament? Have we honestly seen a holy people and a holy king and this, this real dynamic? We haven't seen that. All you've seen is chaos. When, 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 when the physical king is there. But that's the expectation. And that is the physical expectation for Israel. Now, was God lying? Was he just meaning that spiritually and not physically? There was a physic there's a physical dynamic there, which is very, very important. When you look at Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, that I also written down, which is important, is that when God makes this covenant with Israel, which is what you'll find, of course, in, in Exodus. 19 5 to 6 so the covenant is made with them and god is saying to them i've called you you're a special people you this kingdom of priests and if you are faithful then i will bless you and i will uh, basically exalt you etc etc but not every single generation of israel did that but when you read leviticus 26 and deuteronomy 28 what you find there's blessings and curses and people don't understand that. They take that very personally to them, and it becomes a bit of an awkward thing. But what that's talking about is the Jewish people at a certain time are called to be faithful. If they're not faithful, there are consequences. So they fall away. They'll go into captivity, as they did in Babylon, 
And if as a nation, they don't fulfill what God has called them to do, they don't, they're not faithful to this covenant, then there will be consequences. But the next generation then comes and God is still faithful to them. And that generation has a responsibility to be faithful. So it doesn't mean that God just casts Israel aside. That's not the expectation in the Old Testament. It is always that the next generation is called to be faithful. Um, now, this is important. Yes, Maria. Can I, I, I'm not sure I got the bit about the generation. Um, this, uh, he made the covenant in Exodus 19, 5 to 6. He's making it to them. Yes. But it also covers their um, descendants. It does. Every, every generation has to obey. Yes. And any generation that doesn't obey gets the consequences. Is, is yes. that it? Yes. Because you saw that actually in the wilderness, didn't we? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the next generation entered in but the first generation has to die out yeah so right. it, what it is it's just it's a it's a covenant that is eternal but it is conditional if that makes sense yeah yeah that's that's all i'm saying because many people don't see that in the old testament they don't understand that dynamic it's always with israel that's the covenant that's the expectation but it doesn't mean it's that generation we we're still waiting for the generation that, that actually is going to be that faithful generation for Christ to return. And this is where I'm leading to as we get to Revelation, if that makes sense. Okay. Good. So um, I've just written down that the question we have to ask is, when will this fruitful generation be? They will experience the kingdom. That's the question. Sorry? When will the Gentiles yes. call in? So after that, they, but there will be, Jesus said, there will be a generation. Of course, he said, this generation will not pass. And he was talking about the generation that will be the one that's faithful. And ultimately, that is why I believe in Israel's future. Because, yes, you'd have the generations that will fall away, that will not be interested. But there will be a generation that will be faithful, that God will use that will be the generation that will be alive when Jesus Christ returns. And that's important. And that is why when we deal with the law and why I said previously why the law was given, everyone sort of says, well, the law is, has fallen away. Yes, it has, because it doesn't save. But there are principles in this Mosaic covenant that doesn't just vanish. There are still things that need to be fulfilled and is part of the principle of the Mosaic Covenant. And I will highlight that, of course, in the book of, of, of Revelation as well as we move on. So what you have is throughout the Old Testament, you have the focus on Israel as this group of people. And what you see is throughout the Old Testament, what is the key thought? Israel being faithful, whether it's Ezra, whether it's Nehemiah, especially with the Babylonian captivity, whether it's the prophets, it's calling Israel back. That's what you see. Is, is, that's what, what I see in the Old Testament. There's always this call for Israel to come back. Because why? Because the expectation is that this will maybe be the generation that will see the kingdom. But of course, they have to wait for the Messiah. But that's the call. Are we going to be the faithful generation? And that's even what we see in the gospel. So you see that throughout the Old Testament, this call for the, for the Jewish generation to be faithful, and then also in the Gospels. What was, what, was, what was Jesus doing in those three years of ministry? We're still going to get to that, of course, as we, we continue with the series, but what was Jesus doing? Was Jesus evangelizing? Like we do today. Was Jesus going around sort of having a, a sort of um, a sort of holy evangelism outreach process for the whole world or was he calling israel to repentance who was he calling to repentance israel. Hmm. that's what john the baptist did that's what jesus did and it's what he called his disciples to do how do i know that of course for those who haven't heard this i've said this quite often but but jesus sent out people to go and preach the gospel before he died so what gospel were they preaching He hadn't died yet. So they weren't saying repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins. He hadn't died yet. 
So what was the gospel? The gospel was he is the Messiah. This is the time. We're calling this generation together. And that's why John the Baptist baptized, because it was this generation. We want to be this generation. Repent now. Come together as this generation. That was the key call of the Gospels. And again, how do I know this? I share this again with you. Before Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, what is the first question the disciple, or what is the last question the disciple asked, asked him before he ascends into heaven? And they ask him, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Because we're gathering these people now. And it's also what you see in the book of Revelation. If you read Revelation, actually read it with a kingdom mindset. What you see throughout the book of Revelation is a regathering of Jewish people. Because you have 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. You have Revelation 12 where the woman is protected in the wilderness against the persecution and bringing those people together. You have the battle at Armageddon and, and, and coming toward Jerusalem. You have the Zechariah passages that link in with that. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. This generation, the expectation throughout the Old Testament from the, the Mosaic Covenant perspective is always to be that generation that's going to be faithful. That will enter into the kingdom. That's the expectation. That's what you see in the Old Testament. It's what you see in the Gospels. And it's what you see in the book of Revelation. And both the Old Testament and the Gospels all fit under the Old Covenant and under the Mosaic Covenant. Jesus Christ never came to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. Jesus Christ was born under the law. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew were saved under the law. The centurion was saved under the law. They were all saved under the law until Jesus Christ dies. The temple curtain is torn in two, and the new covenant then is ushered in. But everything in the Gospels is still the old covenant. And under the old covenant, Israel is the preeminent nation. And the call to them is to be the generation that will be the one who is faithful, who will then reach the nations. So God, Jesus Christ was always concerned about the nations and reaching them. That was never out of his plan, but it was always to gather the Jewish people together first, because that's part of the covenantal promise. That although you have the Abrahamic covenant that is sort of overarching the specific call with under the mosaic covenant was to be this nation of priests and i share this and it's super controversial and people's minds explode and i know it's super awkward but i like to be awkward on a, on a wednesday evening is that i believe firmly that john the baptist sprinkled people and i know as a baptist it makes people panic and i'm not saying we mustn't immerse but John the Baptist baptized a nation of what? According to Exodus 19, verse 6. Nation of? Priests. Priests. Now, let me tell you, you never fully immerse a priest. Because the only people that were fully immersed were pork eaters who wanted to become Jews. Gentiles were fully immersed. Priests were sprinkled or they had to take their clothes off and wash themselves. That's the Old Testament mode of baptism. And John the Baptist was preparing a people for the coming kingdom and anticipating the Messiah and gathering together as a nation of priests. And in that mode, they would have been at the River Jordan and he would have sprinkled them as priests in anticipation for the coming Messiah. And I know it's awkward. And I know people want to lose their minds. But I, I would stand upon my little soapbox and defend that and ask you, please find immersion, full immersion in the Old Testament. I'd love you to find that verse for me because you're not going to find it. The only mode of baptism in the Old Testament for Jews was sprinkling and either washing. And I'm pretty sure you didn't have the ladies come there and people start taking their clothes off to wash. Do you? 
So the only way was sprinkling and sprinkling of adults. And I know to any Baptist, when you start speaking about sprinkling, we lose our minds. But you don't have to lose your mind. You have to be biblical. Baptists didn't write the Old Testament. So that's important. Why? Because that's the call. That's the expectation of this Mosaic covenant that links in with the kingdom. The overarching Abrahamic, but specifically you have this generation. Hopefully it's going to be us as Jewish people. And that's important. So also connected to that, is that the kingdom in the expectation of the Old Testament, what you need for the kingdom to come is you need a very specific generation that is faithful, but you also need them to be in their land because connected to that is the promised land. Because when they left Egypt, where were they going? To the promised land. So part of the kingdom and part of that generation, as Miriam asked that very good question earlier on. I link that in because the generation that actually received the Ten Commandments were not the generation to enter into the promised land, were they? No. no, they had to die in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb and the children went in. But it's the same Israel, isn't it? So what you need is you need them to be in their land for the kingdom to be a reality. And also that they need to be faithful to God's word. And also you need Christ to rule over them. If you want to know what the kingdom is, it is land. It is a faithful Jewish remnant. I'm saying remnant because I don't believe all Jews are saved. So please don't misunderstand. And, and normally some mischievous people would love to say that, that, that we say that if we believe in Israel's future, not all Jews, a remnant. And Christ will be ruling over them. And that all fits into this mosaic covenant. Kenneth, Kenneth is yes. it right? They did not, through the Old Testament, fully take the land, whole land. There were times they were there, but they never truly possessed it fully, Derek. So they would the, they were the, times, they were times. So maybe under David a little bit and also under Solomon. But we are talking here about being established in that land, dominating that whole area, because it's as we said previously, Derek, it wasn't just what we know now as Israel. There's a bigger portion of the land, hmm. which is the expectation. But it's basically being dominant in that land, which they they're not even now, are they? No. No, they're not dominant there. So they need to, so you need the land, you need them to be faithful, you need Christ ruling over them. So also quite interesting, and I, and I highlight this because it links in with the generation we're looking forward to, is that what you will have is when you read the book of Revelation, what you are seeing is a generation that's being drawn together. Because there's an, the kingdom is coming now, Christ is returning. They might not know what's happening, but God is at work to bring about this remnant. And he brings about this remnant through what? Through tribulation. So you'll see that in Jeremiah 30 verse 7. It speaks about a time of Jacob's trouble. And that time of trouble is about bringing this generation together. You see the same in Daniel as well. So in Daniel 9, you also have the same in Zechariah 12 verse 10. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. They have to be gathered together to, to look upon him as he returns. Also turn with me to Matthew 23, 37 to 39. So Matthew 23, 37 to 39. And I think it's very significant. And, and I know, and, and this is very important, I say this to, to many a Bible teacher shame, including myself. There are times when things are convenient, and I can very conveniently sidestep certain verses. There are times like that. I acknowledge that. Not that I would do it purposefully, but in your theological mindset, there are verses sometimes that you don't want to always specifically drawn to and go to. I get that. What I find extremely strange 
is that there are just certain verses people don't talk about. When it doesn't fit into their theological ambit. Now look, listen to these verses. This is Jesus Christ speaking. This is him looking forward. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you or to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course. It's a several fold fulfillment there because Jesus Christ did come into Jerusalem on a donkey and they did shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. But when you look, of course, in the Zechariah passage, what is the expectation of the second coming? That's the passage. The passage is not referring to Jesus Christ's first advent. It's referring to the second advent. As um, and so beautifully pointed out about the, the song for Christmas, Joy to the World. We sing it in a first Advent, but it's actually a second Advent song. Because the expectation is this return of the Messiah. So again, who will be that generation that will say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord? That generation of the tribulation. Also, let's look at Matthew 24. We're right there. Matthew 24, verse 31. <clears throat> and this is, I have to chuckle again. It's just, wow. When we, when we deal with semantics and the only thought that you ever have in your head is what you wanted to say, it just becomes very interesting when you read the Bible. Like the term church, the term gathered. I mean, in the book of Acts, there's a mob that wants to stone um, Paul, and they call the church, by the way. They're called an ecclesia because they're a group gathering to stone someone. So when you read, you've got to ask, what gathering are we talking about? Because sometimes you've got different gatherings. You've got a mob, and sometimes you've got, well, a mob in church as well sometimes, you know, mobs <laughs> together. But let's look at verse 31 here of Matthew 24. Because, of course, now that if, if people have elect on the brain, it's only referring to Christians, of course, then you're going to read it into anything, <coughs> aren't you? But let's look at what it says here in verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, of course, many Christians will see trumpet and will see Elect and gathered and think rapture. But it's not what Matthew 24 is speaking about at all. Who's the elect here? Christians. I better hope not. I hope that I'm in heaven already. The elect, the elect he's talking about here is the elect of Jews at the time of the tribulation and other believers, those who are the called out of the tribulation. That generation that he elects and calls together to ultimately enter into the kingdom. That's who Jesus Christ is referring to in verse 31. That's what the book of Revelation tells us. So that's why I'm driving this home that you have the first generation, of course, leaving Egypt. And he enters into this covenant with that generation. But every single Jewish generation after has to remain faithful. Otherwise, they will not be that generation. And the next generation might be. And that's the key one. So that when we speak about Israel's salvation, which gets a lot of Bible teachers panicked, if they are not premillennial or dispensational, they get super panicked about what you are saying or all Jews just saved. It's not what we are saying. But what we are saying is that there will be a very specific generation who will be alive. And God will work amongst those Jewish people and they will be a gathering that will enter into the kingdom. Does that, does that make sense? Because that covenant is conditional. And that is the importance of that expectation of the kingdom. That you cannot have the kingdom with a Christian church 
dynamic. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom needs a Jewish remnant to be that generation to fulfill the covenant, which is important. So just in sort of, I'll say conclusion, but it might be a slightly longer conclusion than my, well, might be slightly shorter than my preaching conclusions, which I only say three times and we spend another 40 minutes. That's not what we're going to do. But there are a few very interesting thoughts that I just want to link in, then we can have some questions. Um, if you could turn with me to Zechariah chapter 8. There's just a few verses I want to highlight. We can't look at all of them, but Zechariah chapter 8. And as I said, tonight, this is important to think to think of this gathering, of this group. That's God's, God's expectation and the scripture's expectation. So when you look at Zechariah 8, I just want to look at verse 7 to 8, in the book of Zechariah. It says, um, thus says the Lord of hosts, very important term, by the way, that is always military and defend, God defending his people, Jehovah Sabaoth. It's a very, very important term, Lord of hosts. So, uh, Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save whom? Can't be the Christian there, can it? I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people. I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Hold on to that thought when you think of the new covenant statement that's made. Very important. But what you see there in verse 7, 8, what do you need? And the whole book of Zechariah is about this culmination to lead us into the kingdom. What do you need? You need God bringing his people back. They need to dwell there. And it's about the land and where they are. Then we look at verse 11. Um, it says, but now I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. Why is God going to treat this remnant differently? Because they are faithful. And the remnant's the key word because we are not Zionists who run around believing every single person wearing a yarmulke is saved. Because Jews today are lost if they don't know Christ. They're lost. But there will be a generation that Christ will turn to him and they will be faithful. And that's what the passages are talking about here. And it doesn't just mean it's political Israel at the moment and every Jew living in Tel Aviv, especially. I mean, I know Tel Aviv is like Sodom and Gomorrah. It needs to pretty much explode. But basically, it's not those. But it, among them, there will be some. Kenneth? Yes. Um, normally, when, we, uh, when I've heard the term remnant used, Israel, um, and dare I say even sometimes the church, but, but let's just keep it to Israel here. Um, the it, it's normally kind of used, I think, in the context that the remnant are the faithful ones. Yeah, yeah. spot on. Um, but you said you said that um, why is it the remnant? And obviously, with uh, it says there, I will not treat. The remnant as in the former days i mean in here it's talking about the tribulation isn't it yes but the remnant is still jewish in the context there yes yes so just because they're a remnant doesn't mean they're not connected to the bigger group of jews because they're still ethnically the same yeah yeah no i get that but but i think you seem to say that uh why is it because there's been remnants who are still faithful of previous days yes i know but i don't think it's drawing that dichotomy to look at remnants i think it's talking more about the jewish aspect of it that this remnant is not going to be i'm not going to treat them the same as others oh, i don't think he's drawing the remnant dynamic oh, he's not sort of saying this no, is, no 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 I, 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 i'm with you I no. yeah because that was my I thought that, that 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 would be reading into the text what it's not saying he's just using it in a general sense that this faithful remnant yeah. is the the remnant and i'm not treating them as all the other names Israel generations before who were unfaithful. It just so happens that this remnant happened to be the people that were in the tribulation. As yeah, to yeah, to definitely, definitely, definitely. Spot on. Um, and let's also look at verse 13. And it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, our house of Judah and house of Israel. That's not talking about the church. I mean, it's as plain as day. 
So I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear. Let your hands be strong. Um, and then verse 14. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath. Do you see that mosaic covenant dynamic? And I drive that home. I'm sorry. I, I'm like a bit of a stuck record. <laughs> but basically there you see that there was a generation in the past that weren't faithful. But it doesn't mean that God leaves them. Because God's promise to Israel is not, is not a, his promise to Israel and the overarching promise is not conditional. But the mosaic blessing of that generation is conditional, depending on which generation it is. It says the Lord of hosts, and I will not relent. And then verse 23, I just wrote that one down as well. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So the key there again is Israel and that generation. And that is why when you read the book of Revelation, I highlight this again, read it again. And read it with prophetic eyes and not Christian eyes. If you read the book of Revelation with prophetic eyes based on the old connected to Revelation, you will see something that is very specific that Jesus spoke of, that the Old Testament spoke of. But what happens is people have flown into Revelation, put on their Christian goggles, assuming that it's totally like normal Christian stuff, and they get confused. Because when the term elect is used and the gathering and these, who's it talking about? Can't be talking about the Christian because the Christian's not there. It's talking about some specifically gathering these people. And then the final one of the Zechariah's is chapter 14. I just want to read from verse 16 to 19. I just highlighted this because it is important. So 14, 16 to 19 of Zechariah. And says, this shall be punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this is in the kingdom, by the way. Why are we still keeping the Feast of Tabernacles? Because when you deal with the law, there are certain parts of the law that fulfills its purpose. But it doesn't mean that the law is not still a memorial. Yeah. Not so? A memorial of that generation of God's faithfulness. So the Feast of Tabernacles, what it's about is they remember in the wilderness when they built tents. But ultimately what it's talking about is when God dwells among his people. So when Jesus is on the throne, they can still celebrate tabernacles in its fullness. But but the key here, what I'm what I'm saying is that if if you don't, and this is about nations, so if you don't, you will be punished. And we're going to deal with that as we conclude, because let's look at verse 20. Kenneth? Yes, Kenny. Sorry, um, where, what do you need, or where do you need to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles? In Jerusalem. Just in Jerusalem. Do you need a temple? Yeah, they'll probably need a temple. That's that's sort of what, what, it's, what it speaks of, of course, in Ezekiel. Yeah, no, no, definitely, definitely. Because, again, that this is a debated issue, and it's very important for everyone to understand that there's a lot of debate stuff about the kingdom. But when you look at the Old Testament, there are things that will be there just as memorials, very importantly. And it's not about the law saving. It's not about salvation. It's about what the purpose is as reminders and memorials so here in that day the holiness holiness to the lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses the pots in the lord's house shall be like the bowls i'm um, sorry sorry i wanted what did i want 16 to 19 what did i read sorry i'm going to read from verse 16 I'm, I'm confused let me just correct myself let's go from 16 to 19 i went on further and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left 
of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from here to here to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So please explain to me when this happens. The only time this happens is in the kingdom. Because those nations that are left now come up. When in the history of Israel did they come up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles? They didn't. So this is talking about the future kingdom. When Christ is here, they're going to come up. The nations will come up. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there shall be no rain. Now, why is this important? I'll link this in. Because there's judgment here. And what does the Bible say about Jesus Christ? What will he rule with in the kingdom? Okay, so this thinking that Christians have that we're not under the law, the law just finishes. Yes, from a salvation perspective, 100%. But in the kingdom, the law will still operate. Why? Because the law is perfect. Because why would you in the kingdom, and that's what I find interesting, why in the kingdom would there have to be punishment? And that term used is because when Christ is here, the law is still applicable, not for salvation, but these are the standards. Why would the king need to rule with a rod of iron? Because the kingdom will be a very unique time. Because the kingdom is not heaven. It's heaven on earth, but it's not heaven. Does, does Jesus need to rule with a rod of iron in heaven? Start beating the angels there. What? But, but no, no. The, look, sorry, uh, Kenneth, yes. quick question. So, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is, is this going to be because there's still going to be a whole lot of people that still survive through God's wrath? And that's why that's going to need to be there because those people will still be of the old ways, essentially. Because at some point there is a final battle. And yes, yes. Uh, so to my knowledge, in the kingdom, I don't know if sin ha has been eradicated at that point yet. No, no, it hasn't. Satan's bound. Exactly. But, but what, what, I'm, what I'm connecting there, Aaron, is that when you look at the Mosaic Covenant, which is the law, there are elements of the law, not in the salvation process, but the other parts that still continues into the kingdom because the, the Old Testament law was the perfect dynamic of a theocracy. The kingdom is that theocracy in person, not just in practice. And yeah. even in that, the law still continues because the law of God is good. And for yeah. God to keep peace, because you're still dealing with sinful things which is what we're going to deal with going forward it, it's, it's the worst part of theology is dealing with the kingdom and the sin issue but it is a reality you're still going to have the king ruling with the rod of iron so it's a very interesting dynamic with the law that it still persists within the the kingdom because that's god's design and god's perfection in how he does that so that's why I just share that with you in, in here, that if you don't come up to celebrate this feast, that there won't be rain and there will be punishment. And that is why it's still part of that mosaic covenant dynamic. And that is why the church is different. Because we are not under that same law, but it will still be there. And why I say that is because as Christians, we are all the nations in this new body, the body of Christ, which Paul calls a mystery and the Bible calls a mystery, which is different. And that's why the rapture is important because once the rapture takes place, things are ushered into that older time and dispensation of the law in some ways, not the salvation part, but other parts that are very, very important. Now I find it interesting. And I just highlight this, that if you look at Psalm, don't turn there with me because there's a lot of verses, but you can listen to the recording. Psalm two verse nine, it says that God, will rule with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. It says so in Revelation 2.27. It says so in Revelation 12, verse 5. And it says so in Revelation 19.15. Now, I ask you, if, we are, if the expectation from 
us all is just to go to heaven, that there's going to be no earthly kingdom. Please explain to me why you need a rod of iron. Because if sin is completely eradicated and we're all going to go to heaven and we're there playing our harps with our wings and stuff and everything is perfect and fine and you have this new, new heaven and new earth and you don't have a kingdom, why is there a rod of iron? Because God is not ruling with a rod of iron now, is he? Because if he did, there'd be quite a few pots being smashed up the whole time, every single day. I mean, as they open their mouths on the BBC, you'll just get them smashed. Hmm. So we don't have that. Why? Because the expectation is the time is going to come where the king will be on earth and he will rule with the rod of iron. So that is why in the book of Revelation or from Psalm, the expectation is the law side of the Mosaic covenant doesn't just go away in the kingdom, but it is in its absolute perfection in the kingdom. So don't throw the law away and think it's just, it's gone now. Yes, from a salvation perspective, the lamb has come. That's affected. But we still got more things relating to the law that Christ will institute in his own holiness and righteousness. Because it's part of the expectation. And that you have here. Yeah. Also, another one I just leave with you as part of the process is Revelation 22, 14 to 15. So we turn to Revelation 22, 14 to 15. And this comes back to the law. And please, I'm the last guy to be legalistic here. So please don't get me wrong. And especially when it comes to uh, salvation. Once you get legalistic about salvation, it's super awkward. Because it's not biblical. But we need to realize the reality of why the law was given and what it portrays. Because why in Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15... Do you still have this being said? Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, whoever loves and practices a lie. What is, what is that talking about? It's still talking about divine standards, isn't it? It doesn't just go away. God's divine standard doesn't just vanish. It's just that in the kingdom, it's the first part. And of course, in, in heaven and in eternity, it's the next part where God's true righteousness and holiness is absolutely established. And that is why Exodus 19 and 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 is so important to read and grasp that this is what God is saying. This is my standard. And that standard is eternal. Yes, it might not always be applicable, especially within the church with Gentile nations, 100%, because we're not dealing with dietary things and civil things. I get that. But please don't underestimate the Ten Commandments and what it is saying. As this is my standard, and it's an eternal one. So when we think of the kingdom, you're thinking of the absolute enforcement in its absolute perfection of the law. Is that before the earth is remade? Before. 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 The kingdom is still on this physical earth. Yeah. Remade is after the kingdom has fulfilled its purpose. So for a thousand years, Christ will rule with absolute justice and a rod of iron. And, and then if... after that, it will be heaven and earth. Yes, Sue. Um, during that time, that thousand year reign of Christ on earth, Am I wrong or right in thinking that there will be two types of people on the earth? There'll be those who need ruling with the rod of iron because they're not new creatures. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be um, the saints who have their glorified bodies who will not need ruling with the rod of iron. I think it's a very fair statement to make. Mm. I wouldn't be able to give you all the detail on the dynamic, but the reality mm. is that children will be born in the kingdom yes. there will be the physical process those mm. children might not be regenerate mm. because that doesn't mean that all of them believe and so to keep god's absolute standard of perfection and holiness he mm. needs a rod of iron 
So he will need a hierarchy of people then to enforce justice. Yes. I know hierarchy. <laughs> it's such a such a swear word in our world today. Hierarchy. <laughs> oh, be careful, you know. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So he will it will execute perfect judgment. How mm. he does that, of course, we don't know all the specifics, but there is going to be this, and that's why I'm saying don't throw the law away. Mm. And I'm not saying that, that the church pushes the law, or that we live under this law. That's not church dynamic, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be a time where that perfection is not actually in play. Mm. It makes it difficult for us to do that as nations. Ten commandments are the easy ones, but you can't deal with the other 600. Mm. If that makes sense, or the other laws. But when Christ is here, there will be absolute perfection on that, on that front. And that's, that's very, very important. So I just want you to turn with me, finally... Yeah, you can ask Kenny and while we, I just want to say, turn with me to Jeremiah 31 again. But uh, yeah, Kenny, you were saying? Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I think Sue's term hierarchy is actually a very good one. Oh, it's a, it's a brilliant one. It's just that it's a swear word in the modern world. You can't talk about hierarchies and patriarchies and things. But it's wrong because it says about us co reigning with Christ. Yeah, yeah. Spot yeah. On. Definitely, definitely. And, and, and there will be rewards and you'll have a position and all those type of things mm. are absolute truth. But it's all part of, of, of Christ. And again, he doesn't need people to establish that righteousness. He doesn't. He just can do whatever. But he has chosen certain structures to maintain this reality for the thousand mm. years of peace. So let's just look at uh, Jeremiah 31. I just want to read from, from verse 30, 34. Um, just important. I just drive home this Israel thing again, which is important. It's part of the process. Um, so here in verse 34, it says, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins, and I will remember no more. Now explain to me where the gospel fits in in verse 34. It says you don't have to teach anyone. So what is this talking about? Can this be talking about now? Hmm. Or is it talking about a future? Mm. Yeah. Because when Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem, seated on the throne, are you going to need to tell people that the king is here? <laughs> so, so the new covenant, and this is important, this is the big connection for us tonight, sort of in conclusion. When you look at the new covenant, the new covenant in its fullness is still connected to the old covenant. Not in the salvation part. That falls away. But there is a connection because for the new covenant to be enforced and for the new covenant to be fully in play, you need what? And who do you need? You need the king. So the church has the blessing of living out the spiritual principles of the new covenant, okay? which is, of course, the Holy Spirit in us and the law written on our hearts, the spiritual dynamics. But there's more to it because verse 34 clearly expects that with the new covenant comes a time where you're not even going to have to share with your neighbor mm. because it's expecting something. Let's look at verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. It is not the church because the church is not a nation. Hmm. The church is nations. So the Lord is saying that sooner the sun will disappear and the moon will not function, then Israel will cease to be that people for me. Verse 37, thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I, also, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. And that is why the key to the Mosaic covenant and Abrahamic covenant is just driving home that God has made a covenant with these people. They are his covenant people. And at the moment, the Christian is at the forefront of, we are the tip of the spear. 
Israel has been set aside. That's another conversation we'll have going forward. They are not the generation to fulfill that purpose yet, but the time will come where they will be. And in the meantime, the church is the tip of the spear. We are Christ's body. We have a very important purpose. It's not about Israel. It's about the church, yes. But it doesn't mean, according to these passages, that Israel is cast away. Because God then does not fulfill his word. So you can try and squeeze uh, the church in that is talking about the church. You can try and do that if you want to. But I don't believe this is what the passage is saying. If you read it plainly and literally, is it? It's speaking about the future of Israel. And that is why when you read the new covenant, and I share this again, the old covenant, of course, passes away in what it, its fulfillment was to bring about the Messiah. Then the new covenant is made. But the new covenant and the old covenant has a specific dynamic to it because it's made with a people. If you look at um, yeah, verse, where am I? Uh, verse 31, who's the covenant made with in that verse? House of Israel and the house of Judah. It's, it's not saying anyone else. So it's made with Israel. As the old one was made with Israel, so the new one is. But the fulfillment of this new covenant is that generation that will be alive at the return of Christ. Not so. They'll be the ones who will truly see the fruit of the new covenant. And the true fruits of the new covenant is very specific. That is revival in Israel. Okay, Because Ezekiel 36, 37, 38 speaks about that as well. So what you'll see is you'll see revival in Israel, you'll see the return of Christ, and you will see the kingdom established. And then no need for evangelism because the king is here. That's the ultimate fulfillment of the new covenant. But in the meantime, there are, there are sort of, as you look at, if you're trying to catch oil in your hands, there's some drippings. And the drippings of that comes to the church to live out, which is, of course, the Holy Spirit and all the things. But the absolute compression of fullness will be when Christ returns of this new covenant, but it's still connected to the Mosaic covenant as it relates to the people, which is very, very important. And that is absolutely vital. So then in conclusion, the final statement I make before we can open some questions briefly is the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. Mm -hmm. That's forever. It will be fulfilled to... Whether Abraham was faithful, whether Israel is faithful, that covenant remains. And the Mosaic covenant is conditional in the blessings of them to any certain generation. But it will always continue for the next generation. But it doesn't mean that generation will actually be the faithful ones. But then ultimately, the blessings of both the full blessings of the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenant will be experienced in its fullness when the final remnant of Jewish people, the final generations alive when Jesus Christ returns. And that's when you'll have the kingdom being unfolded. And when you read the Gospels, Jesus knew that that was not the generation that he spoke to. He knew that. But there will be a generation in the future that it will be. And that's what we look forward to. And that's why the Mosaic Covenant is so important. Okay, any questions? So really that kingdom could never come um, before the Gentiles came in, ever. Well, the Old Testament didn't say that, but now no, we know. But we know because the mystery has been revealed, exactly. but they didn't know. They didn't know that. And that's why Jesus couldn't hint of that because mm. he was still gathering them together and saying, come. And I know that you're not, but it needs to be fulfilled. So mm. he still did that. And then the mystery was revealed once it was very clear that that generation will not be the generation. Mm. Sad. Mm. Well, suppose it's a blessing it, for us. Because <laughs> the uh, Jews were so earthly minded that they were expecting this kingdom and this king that when Christ came, he was a disappointment to them and that he didn't kick the Romans out and establish the kingdom. And it's yeah. going to take for the Jews the tribulation to bring them to repentance or a, a remnant of them to repentance. Mm. 
Definitely. But I also think on top of that, Matt, so it's both and what you were saying, I think the key was that remember that this generation has to be spiritual. Mm. So the earthly mind thing you mentioned is very true. But even though Jesus did not fulfill this sort of Che Guevara revolutionary <laughs> mindset that they had, it was because, not because they were spiritual and he did not fulfill it, but it's because they were unspiritual mm. Mm. and they were ungodly mm. and therefore did not see him. Mm. So the, the emphasis there is not on him not fulfilling because he did, but it's more upon them not being able to see because they, they were unspiritual, mm. ungodly. Mm. But there will be a generation that will be spiritual and godly and therefore the tribulation is important. I stress that again, the purpose of the tribulation is to bring Israel to repentance. Mm. And you had a tribulation before Jesus came because you had Antiochus Epiphanes and yeah. you slaughtered the pig and all that stuff. But that did not bring, that brought the Maccabean revolt, but it never brought true regeneration in that nation. But the future generation will have that, that will be alive when Christ returns. But we need the spiritual side to happen in those people's lives. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just, I mean, what do you think would cause that? I mean, obviously, you've got the tribulation and the horrendous things that are going to happen during that time. Is, is that something that would cause them to become more spiritual and, and see the physical in a different kind of way? That, um... yeah, definitely, I believe so. And also, again, if, if how God's sovereignty works, if he's just telling us that this is going to happen, because he's telling us there will be a generation that we save, and his role in that. So we, we, we can't undermine God's sovereignty in the whole process either. Mm. So is it impossible? I mean, there we have the Isaiah passage that God can birth a nation in a day, Isaiah 66. Is it impossible for him to do? No. It's not. So it's not impossible for him to save. It's not impossible for him to know the heart of man and for him to do certain... Because when you look, again, look at the book of Revelation, look at the judgments and then read egypt mm. you see the similarities there don't you mm. Mm. he's dealing with the same concept and it is quite yeah it's quite interesting that there's real there's a real link with the plagues of revelation and the plagues of egypt to bring about this reality that this is what the father spoke of this is what the torah says mm -hmm. this is what we know and look it's happening again and therefore, they will turn to him, some, not all. Yeah. And therefore, is it, that's why the, the, the revelation thing to me is very important. That we read more <laughs> remnant in there and more and, and appealing to the Jewish mind in revelation and just going in there and thinking it's a normal Christian dynamic. It's not. Mm. Also, Kenneth, on, um, in our, in response, because we're going to go into questions. Question. Um, they will also, there'll be a large segment of um, <coughs> who God will physically protect for a period of time. Yeah. You know, so they will see the evidence, there'll be evidence that they'll see how God has protected. Them. Yeah, de definitely. Definitely. There'll be so many things happening that God's going to use. And of, co of course, we know that we don't walk by faith, of by sight, but by faith. But there'll be things that God uses to speak to people. All of us have a testimony of God using something in many of our lives, um, events or people or whatever it might be. So I, I'm, I'm super confident of this because looking through the prism of now when I'm sitting in Marlow and, you know, every single house around us, they're not interested. You know, you hand out your flyers and they go to football rather than coming to church. We get it. But that's our perspective of the world now. When it gets the tribulation, God is, it's a different dynamic. So let's not undermine God's ability to save and work in those times. It's going to be rock and roll, trust me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. Any more uh, final question? I've got one more. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> one more. <laughs> um, so obviously you mentioned about... Um, uh, Jeremiah 31, you're talking about the new covenant. 
often in our in our sort of Christian community, we talk about new covenant. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong in my kind of view on it is that it's not necessarily wrong per se to sort of refer to, but if it, but our view of the new covenant for us today, it, it should be seen as a shadow of the real McCoy. Yeah, true. True. So is the, yeah. Exactly. The best example is the Ten Commandments in comparison to the other commandments. When you talk about the law, you're not just talking about the Ten Commandments. There are more to that in, its, in how it plays out. The New Covenant is the same. But the core principle, yes, but there's more to it. It's more multifaceted than what it's portrayed as in, in Christian circles. Yeah. Definitely. McCoy is, the- is when Christ is here. Then, then it's the fullness of it. Definitely, definitely. Good. Mm-hmm. So this is the most challenging one because I think a lot of teaching on this relating to the law and grace and stuff. So it's more of a Christian teaching thing, but I just really wanted to drive home this generational thing to this covenant, which then links it into the kingdom going forward, which is very, very important. Okay. So thank you very much. We're going to close in prayer. Thank, thank you, you, Kenneth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and truth, and we thank you for your grace to us this evening and your grace to us throughout our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you are in control, and and Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to um, really be faithful in the times in which we live, but also, Lord, use every opportunity. We don't know how long we have. It's all in your timing. It's all in your hands. And Lord, we just pray that whatever time you give us, help us to use it for your honor and glory and Lord, we also just pray at this time for for all people and that they will turn to you and we know that we don't have to try and force a generation of jews to believe because that's all in your hands ultimately and that's out of our control we leave that to you lord help us in this time to share the gospel with every creature every person and that they will then hear the gospel and then turn to you. So we just pray that you'll use us as we are expectant of your return to take us to be with you. And then ultimately we await also the coming kingdom physically on earth where where you will show us what true rule is and godly righteousness. And Lord, we long for that and to see that. And we just thank and praise you, Lord, for the fact that your word will be fulfilled. So we come before you tonight thanking you for this time. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kenneth. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.